Welcome to Plymouth 400 Conversations. I'm Michelle Pecoraro, and I'll be your host for this series. The 400th commemoration of our nation has inspired a body of creative work, poetry, film, literature, and art. This series will explore several of these projects and how they contribute to the historic, educational, and cultural legacies of the Plymouth 400 commemoration. In this episode, we look at a new approach to the Journal of William Bradford, Plymouth's longest standing governor. The manuscript of Plymouth Plantation, Bradford's journal, reflects new scholarship through annotations and contributions by several historians. Publisher Brenton Simons is also the CEO and president of New England Historic Genealogical Society, and he will be with us today. Brenton, welcome to Plymouth 400 Conversations. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful that you're here. I'm going to jump right in, Brenton. We have a lot of uh, ground to cover with this wonderful book. So um, the foreword to the 400th anniversary edition of, of Plymouth Plantation promises a reassessment of the meaning of Plymouth Colony. Would you elaborate on your publisher's vision for that? Well, sure. One of the most exciting parts of this quadricentennial to me has been the uh, amazing spurt in scholarship that has occurred. And nothing is more important to this commemoration than studying the original text of William Bradford. And so what we have is a book, a multi-editor book, uh, that does provide a reassessment and it, for the first time, includes a segment on the Native American view of what happened. And that is written, uh, that was written by Paula Peters and is one of the most important parts of this book. And so what we wanted to do in publishing this was to bring out new awareness of this topic, uh, have the experts provide historical context and present viewpoints that hadn't been uh, presented in earlier editions of Bradford's work. Very good. This new edition was a result of a collaboration as well uh, of several institutions, and I'll name a few of them, the American Antiquarian Society, the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, the Harvard University Library, uh, uh, Colonial North American Project, and Pilgrim Hall Museum as well as several reliable historians and notable historians. Um, the esteemed group is named New England Beginnings. Uh, what can you tell me about this collaboration and how it came to be? Well, New England Beginnings is really the uh, brainchild of Frank Bremer, a noted historian, the editor of the Winthrop Papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and a number of his colleagues. And what it was and is designed to do is bring together a group of institutions. You named a number of them. It also includes my institution, American Ancestors, and others, um, over 40 institutions, and about 50 uh, independent scholars who feel that this is important, this subject is important to study and to create new information and make it available to wider audiences and to really set the stage for a series of 400th anniversaries that begin now with, of course, with the Plymouth 400th anniversary and uh, in 2030 culminates with the 400th anniversary of the founding of Boston. And so this is a great group and uh, we were delighted at my society to be able to help sponsor this publication and support the editors who've done such fine work in putting it together. Very good. And, this... and I should just say, if I may just say, Frank yes. Bremer I mentioned, but there's also Ken Minkema, who right. is a professor at Yale, and Jeremy Bangs, who is very well known as the director of the Leiden American Pilgrim Museum in the Netherlands and Paula Peters, who uh, wrote the uh, foreword to this book and who is uh, a principal of Smoke Signals and a member of the Wampanoag people. 
So this book uh, was really a collaboration in and of itself of those organizations and also of those four authors. Um, that is, that's, yes. it's, it's probably the first time, I'm sure, in history that's happened. Um, the 400th anniversary edition does restore the language and formatting of the original, but in addition, and this is what's so very uh, mo motivating about this, is there are numerous notations and ample footnotes uh, and extensive indexes that, um, that are worthy of reading by scholars or you know, people who are just interested in this, in this moment in history. Um, can you um, mention one or two of these worthy uh, emendations? Well, that's a great point, Michelle. And, you know, one of the objectives of this is to make the Bradford text accessible to anyone who wants to read it. And by having editors with various and varying specialities write uh, discursive footnotes, you get the historical context. It brings more of the 17th century parlance used by Bradford uh, to light. Uh, it explains historical uh, moments with greater clarity. And so this was very important. And, um, and I think anyone who reads this edition is going to be just as motivated by the uh, multitude of footnotes uh, by reading them as by reading Bradford's text. And they work so well together on each page. And there are special sections of the book too. I, uh, for example, uh, would mention Bradford's Hebrew list of Hebrew words. Uh, when he was older, he writes that I am now old and I wish to study the original language of the Bible. And so he put together this very interesting uh, list of Hebrew words, and that is treated as an appendix in the book with historical narrative explaining it. So it's a very rich text and unlike any previous edition of this uh, fascinating journal. And it is different in another way. And um, you had mentioned Paula Peters, and she did an introductory essay. Uh, she writes about the old, where I'm quoting this, the old world interlopers and their prevailing lack of humanity toward native people. Can you discuss this problem of cultural uh, dissonance, and, and does the book uh, change this narrative? Well, you know, this is, I think this is the most powerful and frankly important and innovative part of this book. And Paula has written, a, it is a beautifully worded, uh, thoughtful, thought-provoking, at times painful, uh, essay to read. And it is important for us to know the Native American perspective. And as I've said, this has never been included in any prior edition of Bradford's work. And so to me, this is something that was really an essential part of this book and made it, as a publisher, made it uh, so worthwhile to us and to audiences who, who need to read this. And so so I think Paula does an amazing job. And it is, it's an area where you can see things. It's very clear that, you know, we take pride, as we should, in some of the accomplishments of the pilgrims. But we also can see here, as the editors say, that as one group took steps to a new life, it changed the life forever of another group. And uh, so, so that is important context to this book. It also, I would have said before this, that by having this as a, a part of the book, it presents a, a balanced view. But the editors point to a Native historian who refers to this as a braided view, and that the history can be intertwined in amazing ways. And so I really, I love that phrase, and I think it does a great uh, job of describing what we're doing here. And, and the fact that you, in reading this and then reading Bradford's text and the historic interpretations of his text, as I tell people, you have to be prepared to accept paradox. Again, 
you have to accept the fact that uh, that the as the pilgrims fought for their freedom and escaped persecution and started a new life and in many ways had a profound effect on our American uh, democracy and even our way of life, uh, th this compromised and forever affected the lives of and, and history and culture of other people. And so, so this edition is really very special in that it presents a braided view of history. I love that term. It's so beautiful. And, you know, it's, it's uh, as you know, because you are also a board member of Plymouth 400, and you are the co-chair of the state commission for the 400th anniversary, um, and we've been doing this a long time, Brenton. Um, you know that Plymouth 400 yes. really set out, yeah, I know, to, we really set out to um, acknowledge the, the cultures that were here in the, in the 17th century, um, and to especially balance the history between what we know about the pilgrims and how we've been, you know, taught that in school and with, with what's been left out, not revised, but left out, um, and now is being, we're, we're attempting to add back in, and that is what is the Native culture? What did they experience from their perspective, from their culture that was not in our history books, that was not experienced by others. And so um, I think that NEHGS and American Ancestors has, you know, being a venerable old organization, how long? How long have you been in existence? Uh, now 175 years. Right. So I think uh, <laughs> kudos to you, Brenton, um, as the leader of this organization for really taking on something that um, uh, that could be well, that is controversial, um, but because yeah. of what your organization does in the area of genealogy is is also very important to to uh, to know and be aware of. And well, that... thank you. And you know, we take our job very seriously in providing history for all yeah. peoples, peoples of all backgrounds. And so, so this is it's really an honor and a privilege to give. Uh, people like Paula Peters a platform to communicate their history in their words and for us to learn from them. Right, and we do approach things very differently, even today as cultures. Um, and so I do think that um, this is only the beginning of, of, uh, of us representing cultures that traditionally in history have not been represented at least not fully represented. So I thank you for that. And, um, That's right. But I know something about you besides you being, um, you know, all of those other titles I mentioned. You are also a Bradford descendant. You descend from Governor William Bradford. Um, and uh, he yeah. writes from the perspective of a European confronting the native people. Um, the European notation of vacuum domicilum uh, came to symbolize the language differences and cultural ambiguities uh, between the Pilgrim and Wampanoag people. Would you explain the doctrine um, and its resulting effect on the relationship between those two groups? Sure. It's put very simply, it is the about the uh, in land, a, a vacuum domicilium is about having the the European, the English in this case, be able to occupy, take, purchase, uh, commandeer land because it is perceived as vacant. And of course, this was a, a huge cultural difference between the Englishmen and the native people. Uh, and it led to the sort of rampant expansion of the colony. Um, and in fairness, when, of course, when the pilgrims arrived, the Great Plague had occurred in earlier years, and so whole villages had been wiped out, and there are records uh, in Bradford of seeing skeletons lying presumably right where people had died. And so, so there was a sort of a vacancy to the place in, in not all places, but in certain places to a European mindset. 
and the doctrine of being able to acquire the land, which was so different from the native view. And so examples of how this adversely affected the natives, even in the first uh, treaty, was that, uh, for example, if the cattle of the uh, settlers trampled the Native Americans' crops, um, the Englishmen would say, well, why didn't you put up a fence? Why aren't you blockading or creating a barrier around your land? And that was just not a concept used by the Wampanoag or other Native peoples. And so this allowed for an encroachment. And the English, like the Dutch, attempted to pay for the land that they were acquiring, but of course, in grossly uh, undervalued terms. And so this was part of how the uh, land was, was essentially overtaken by the English uh, because of a complete, complete difference in the view of how land is owned. And, you know, many of the uh, native villages were seasonal. So that again added to the uh, difficulties that the English had in comprehending how the native people viewed land and land ownership. And so that was one of the, that, that's a topic covered very well uh, by the editors in this edition. That is wonderful. That's, um, so to his credit, Bradford includes many, many primary sources, uh, source materials, but he also writes for a purely English view of events. So would you talk about the intended audience uh, and his latter revisions to the text. Yeah, so so Bradford clearly intended this to be a journal for his family, maybe even for descendants of other uh, members of the party. Uh, it was not published in his lifetime, and he certainly wrote it from his English viewpoint uh, or the viewpoint of a separatist. Uh, and and it's hard as as a descendant, and I am I'm descended from him actually three times over. So well. there's a lot of Bradford <laughs> in me, and and I admire him, of course, because he was the first historian in America through through this keeping this amazing journal. Um, but it is it's tough for me to read at times the the way he views uh, native people, and. You know, he this was a this was a, a a mindset of the of the period, and he is no different from many others who held the same view, and and it, it reminds me of something that uh, Wamsutta wrote in the suppressed speech mm -hmm. uh, that quote history wants us to believe that the Indian was a savage, illiterate, uncivilized animal, and so it's painful to me to see that my ancestor held that view uh, of Native people somewhat softened when they began to interact more and create treaties uh, and, and need the assistance out, out of just sheer necessity of the Native American people. But nonetheless, the, um, his view of Native people is painful to me. Um, also because, on just a personal note, in addition to being descended from the Pilgrims, I also have a Native American line, and this is not something I learned through a DNA test. I knew about this, and it is well documented, and DNA certainly verifies it. And so I like to think of from that I have a, 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 a foot in both areas here, and so it is, it's tough at times. On the other hand, Bradford does an amazing job of telling the story. It is a compelling read. He is a very good writer. And so it is, it's a worthwhile read. But that's the part that is challenging mm. from a 21st century standpoint. Absolutely. We, we think so differently now. And we've evolved. And so uh, um, it was... It, was, it, it is interesting to, to be re-looking at this, this work. You know, the original investors from the London Company really uh, relied heavily on recovering their financial underpinnings. But for years, the original colonists, colonial settlers remained in debt. Um, 
the actions of the undertakers were critical to the very survival of Plymouth. Would you tell us about these undertakers? Yes, well, you know, it's easy to forget that in the sort of sweeping saga of the story and the quest for religious freedom and the privations of the uh, journey to America and the dreadful first winter and all the other aspects of the story that are celebrated, Thanksgiving and so forth, uh, there was a financial element to this uh, experiment. And, uh, and as you say, there were investors uh, John Beecham uh, in, was perhaps most influential among them. Uh, and the early costs of Plymouth, many of which had simply had to be written off. Um, it was not a, a financial success to begin. But several years in, uh, Bradford and John Howland and other of my ancestors and others uh, created this group of undertakers to assume the debt of the colony and to begin basically a repayment plan or a payment plan uh, with the uh, investors. And this allowed for such things as a monopoly for some number of years on uh, exporting beaver pelts, which brought good money. Um, but more importantly, it also allowed for each household or each family and each adult male to receive a portion of land up to 20 acres and that gave a real foothold to the colony that it previously hadn't had and was the cause of expanding it out beyond the original bounds and so so as the work of the undertakers progresses you see a an ex, really an expansion of the original settlement so uh, you know, and Bradford, of course, had had some experience in managing money. He'd had an inheritance. He was an orphan, um, but later, uh, as a young adult, he had a, an inheritance. So he knew something about managing money. And so uh, he writes in his journal about how the development of this undertaker's plan was so um, such a blessing to the group. Thank you. Um and Bradford has variously been described as, and I quote, a narrator, a moral regulator, a mediator, and a businessman. As a descendant of William Bradford, um, what new insights on your ancestor did you discover um, from the inception of this project? Well, I think for me, it, it was, and I mentioned it uh, earlier, just the, the difficulty I have with his view of uh, Native people as somehow subhuman or less important, or really only gaining stature if they were um, became Christians. Uh, mm -hmm. So there, uh, obviously, that's tough to read. Um, but I do have great admiration for him, um, and, and you know, there are, uh, he writes in such inspired ways. Uh, you and I both know, because I've been asked to recite it on That's many right. occasions in Plymouth, the One Small Candle passage, uh, which is some of the most beautiful writing and inspirational writing in the colonial period. Um, so, so he, on one hand, is, uh, inspires. The editors point out something which is true too, which is um, Bradford didn't want to comment in his journal on things he thought were being covered elsewhere. So very little commentary oh. on the buildup to the English Civil War and a lot on local sex crimes in Plymouth. So there are a few <laughs> surprises in this book for everyone. Very good. Well, they, that's uh, another reason for people to look for this book. Um, the, yes. In the original of Plymouth Plantation, uh, it experienced, the book itself, the manuscript, Bradford's actual handwritten book, um, it experienced its own interesting voyage through time and space. Um, would you give us a brief chronology in the last few minutes that we have here um, of this original manuscript, where it started, and uh, it, how it disappeared, and where it is now? Sure. Well, Bradford, uh, we know that Bradford wrote it in two spurts, uh, beginning in the 1630s and then again 
uh, around 1650 or so, picking it up again and revising parts of it. And it passed from his son to his grandson to his great grandson. And by the time of his grandson and great grandson, uh, historians were asking to borrow it, to use it in writing their own histories of the founding of New England. And in the uh, certainly by the first quarter or so of the 18th century, Thomas Prince, a minister, uh, was given the manuscript by the Bradford descendants to include in something called the New England Library, which was a, a library of materials housed in the tower at the Old South Church. And that, so we have that chain of evidence is very solid. But then it's a little unclear as to what happens, whether uh, whether another scholar perhaps brought it to England in working on a, a book and died and it somehow made its way to Fulham Palace, the seat of the Bishop of London, or whether during the revolution, and this is the more conventional view, uh, that a soldier uh, brought it, simply brought it back to England and then it found its way to Fulham Palace. Either way, by the 1840s, it is located by the Bishop of London and Americans become aware of this. It's been a missing treasure of American history. And then begins this curious period of about 50 years of uh, America seeking to have this original pilgrim text restored, uh, brought back to, to this country. And finally, uh, in 1897, the American ambassador to the court of St. James's petitions to have it returned to the United States. And in those documents, which are fascinating in and of themselves, you see various institutions vying for it. Will it go to Pilgrim Hall in Plymouth? Mm -hmm. Will it go to the Massachusetts Historical Society? Will it go to the State Archives? Right. And of course, as we know, it ended up at the State House in Boston, where it still resides. And flashing forward to 2019, uh, the State House announced that it had uh, funded a display case so that it can be on special occas occasions be seen by the public. And, and that's very important because it is one of the great treasures of American history. And uh, in, and in as much as um, other documents, and you and I have talked about this right. before, the Magna Carta or version or copies of the Magna Carta have come here. And we get to see, seeing important texts like this is very important. So, so my hope and our hope is that more people will be able to see this in the future, keeping in mind that it's obviously 400 plus years old and <laughs> it, it needs to be under very strict curatorial conditions, right. but being able to see it is important. It is. You know, Brenton, I could talk to you about this manuscript, this book, all day because there's so much new information. Um, I thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Plymouth 400 Conversations. Thank you for joining us for Plymouth 400 Conversations. Special thanks to our sponsors and guests who have made this series possible. And special thanks to our partners, PAC-TV and the Center for Active Living in Plymouth. For more information about this book or how to view past episodes, please visit our website, Plymouth400inc.org. Until next time, go make some history.